All right, hello everybody. Steve Henry here from Option Alpha, and it is my pleasure today to welcome the king of the crumbs himself, Jem Carson, aka Jam Croissant. Jem, great to have you on with us today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk options, markets, volatility, uh, and everything. I can't think of a better, better way to start off 2024. So welcome, and thank you for coming on. Oh, my pleasure, Steve. Good to be here. Awesome, my friend. Uh, well, well can, Jem, you've been really one of my favorite follows out there for a few years. Um, three or four years I've been following you on the Twitter or the X, whatever you want to call it these days. And you have been phenomenal about sharing your insights, your perspectives, your unique approach, looking at the markets, flows, and structures. I've learned a lot from you. I have to admit, sometimes I feel equally smart and dumb coming out of some of these conversations because I realize I'm learning, but there's so much more to learn. So I'm looking forward to have you share all of that with our community here today. Um, you're obviously a master of the emojis, the gifts, dare I say, becoming quite the songwriter as you go along with some of your fun uh, rewriting of lyrics. So um, let's go ahead on that note. Let's just jump in before we dive into to talking markets and things like that. Why don't you give us a brief introduction, a background for those of uh, the traders that may not know you? Um, keep it brief, but uh, I started in the business in 1998. I uh, came out to Chicago. Um, onto the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Uh, eventually started my own market making operation um, uh, in 2006. Uh, became uh, kind of one of the biggest market makers in the equity option land. I've uh, started Precision Capital, which at its peak was 13% of the volume of the S&P 500 options and one of the biggest equity options uh, market makers you know, on the planet. Um, crazy years, great financial crisis. Uh, at the end of that, in 2010, uh, I decided to take a break, uh, sold my business, and uh, started my own family office, uh, eventually running institutional money uh, alongside our family office and starting an asset uh, manager called Kai Volatility. So now, uh, for now, two and a half years, been running our own uh, set of family hedge funds, um, both for institutional and uh, high net worth clients, all non-correlated or inversely correlated. We have a long vol hedge product and two absolute return strategies um, as well as a multi-strat so kind of a, a broad array of different offerings um, for different investors um, in different environments um, but uh, our core expertise is twofold one as a market maker really deep expertise and relative value in, in options and what's cheap what's expensive uh, what when is there an opportunity on a relative value basis which is very static and then the part that other people know me kind of probably better for on social media which is the predictive part really this bringing to uh, to the masses, the broad importance of positioning in the market, particularly the options markets, and the predictive value of that, both for uh, implied uh, you know uh, uh, core volatility prediction as well as importantly market direction in, in the underlying assets. So uh, that's kind of uh, broad expertise. Outside of that, uh, you may hear me talk macro at times. I have a deep, uh, long lasting kind of uh, love and, and interest in. Policy. Uh, I study politics and policy, uh, policy, policy science as well as statistics and economics in college and uh, have lived all over the world and grew up kind of across cultures. So that's another deep uh, interest of mine as well, but maybe not as much of an interest for our options guys today. To tap into all of those, actually, we'll kind of work our way around, maybe start broadly because you do definitely have some very unique insights on the macroeconomics, geopolitical landscape. Obviously, a very interesting year heading into an election year. Um, so I would be remiss if we didn't touch on some of that as we work our way through today's conversation. But maybe we'll start it off here in the options ballpark. I do feel like it's a great week for us to get together and chat, right, based on you know, coming off the heels of this big January OPEX last week. You've obviously discussed that leading up to it, but I feel lucky to be able to talk to you on the aftermath of that, right? We kind of Running up to that date, you spoke of this window of weakness, which I'd love for you to elaborate on and maybe how we can use that predictively going forward. We, you know, the markets kind of gave us a little hint of that and then went away just as quickly as we're right back up here entertaining the ideas of uh, all time highs and things like that. So from your perspective, I, I would love to hear these windows of weakness you speak of. How, how do you identify those? So, the you know, to back it up a little bit and kind of look from 30,000 feet, um, you know, the market is people get all too often divorced from this very simple idea that a market is just a, a voting machine, right? A, a set of buyers and sellers. 
Uh, there's so much narrative. Everything you turn on Bloomberg, CNBC, every article you read in the Wall Street Journal is about not that. It's about uh, markets as a uh, fundamental investment vehicle. Um, and uh, there's lots of deep research that nobody listens to, which essentially says fundamentals are essentially non-correlated, uh, not predictive in any way for outcomes of anything shorter than a 10-year period. Um, that's why the Schiller PE was developed because people, uh, you know, he smoothed to 10 year uh, performance to, because that's what, again, statistically uh, where fundamentals matter, uh, which means not only does, you know, fundamentals and the importance of uh, certain earnings and economic cycles and all of these things, do they not matter on an annual basis? But they don't matter, definitely don't matter on a, on, on a quarterly, weekly, daily basis. And yet that's what we're all looking at and trading based on, right? Um, and if that's the case, uh, what does matter? You know, why why does this thing go up or down? You know, and and what drives buyers and sellers? And the part that ninety percent plus of the people who invest money, even the people who are, you know, paid to invest your money, miss is that so much of it has nothing to do with uh, anything that they think about. Most of it has to do with positioning um, and structural effects that uh, are essentially not related at all to anything fundamental. Uh, some of those things are passive, just the fact that people have to keep investing money at a certain, uh, you know, reinvestment. There's momentum effects that are tied to that. Uh, you know, Mike Green, among others, has talked about that in detail. Some of that is just tied to uh, buybacks and things that exist as a function of, of uh, broad uh, market structure. And that's tied more to interest rates than it is to anything other, you know, other than that. Uh, Issuance and treasuries uh, and, and liquidity that comes from uh, the Fed and, and the Treasury as a, as, a, as a function of those things. These are things that some people have kind of tuned into and think more about it. But another very, very big one that that uh, people don't talk about, and I think I'm probably the person that's talked about it the most for the last three, four years, is the flows that come off structurally from the options markets, which are increasingly, have always been, but increasingly a, a critical part of the supply and demand in markets. And that, um, that is a huge um, and predictive, much like a lot of these other flows um, thing. You know, that is a, that is, that is a, uh, a set of flows that we can measure and we can understand and that we can directly subtract or add from the bottom line of supply and demand. Now, it's not the whole story, right? Uh, it is part of a, a bigger symphony of, um, of instruments playing in a supply and demand concert, right? And you have to measure it accordingly. Sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's weaker, sometimes uh, it's 10% of the flow, sometimes it's 50. But to not measure it and not to understand it would be to completely divorce yourself from the realities of supply and demand and, and uh, to, to not have that edge, which is a critical part. Now, prediction, if you have 50% or 30% or whatever the number of, of the equation is, paired with maybe some some other percentiles here and there from other things um, that doesn't lead to uh, a exact prediction, right? That leads to uh, somebody looking through a keyhole as opposed to standing on the other side of a door without a look into anything at all. Um, you're more likely to be able to predict what's happening on the other side of that door by looking into that keyhole. But uh, does that mean you're not, you're going to see everything coming out from the left or the right side or understand the full context of what's going on? Probably not. Um, um, but it does give you a significant edge and, and probability um, is what we, we do here in options land. And that's what we've done um, as, as a market maker for many years. So we pair that broad understanding of probability to, to model predictive distributions uh, of what's likely based on what we know. And we model that against uh, what the options markets are um, pricing in as, as probability, which generally are quite different. Um, and uh, that's a, big chunk of what we do. Um, now, if we're going to dive deeper and say, okay, windows of weakness, simplify it for me, right? Yeah, first of all, it's not simple, but if you want me to simplify, you know, um, uh, you know, how you handle these windows of weakness, you have to have some insight into how big the open interest and the positioning is not just in the uh, publicly listed equity markets, but structured products um, and where those lie in terms of calendar expirations and what then the, the reaction function is, of that positioning, right? And uh, and there are certain trends to that. 
which you can kind of, if you want to simplify it, you can get some, some level of, okay, there's a window here, there's a window here, because these are monthly expirations and they're more likely to have more open interest. You know, quarterly expirations are more, so maybe that's a more important one. And so there's certain trends you can draw across those, but at the end of the day, you are assuming a lot there. Um, you're assuming some probability of certain things happening. Uh, uh, some probability, sorry, of, of certain positioning existing as a function of the calendar. Um, whereas what we do is actually go and look at that and measure how big is that positioning? What does that mean? And also obviously have a deep understanding of what the reaction function to that mean based on who is holding that and particularly, you know, dealers and their reaction functions. So the answer is it's complicated. I can give you general trends of, of, things. And again, I've talked about this pretty publicly for quite some time on a lot of different venues. Um, but the overwhelming majority of structured flows in the options world are long put and short call. That's a trend. Why? Because the world is long, right? If you, if you, uh, I said this often, but if you, you're alive, you eat, sleep, breathe, you're long. I don't care if you have stocks, if you don't have stocks in your portfolio, if you own a house, you're long, if you have a job, you're long, if you, uh, if you live in, uh, you know, spend money in this world, you're long. And as a function of that, the whole world since time incarnate has been hedging downside, right? Um, and uh, they've done that in different ways. In 87, we had a big crash as a function of uh, insurance, uh, right? Uh, that, the, you know, not that different than what options are now in some ways, right? Uh, and and we've seen dealer positioning and the, and the importance of it many times throughout many big moves in history, but people keep moving on and saying, you know, don't look at that, that's not important. Just keep, just keep talking about fundamentals. Um, but you can see when that exists, when those are problems and more accurately predict when risks exist as a function of imbalance in supply and demand. And, and in these windows, particularly big monthly expirations, um, and then even more importantly, quarterly expirations, you have um, a broad window in which there's supportive Von and charm flows, which are at the same time existing in parallel, by the way, it's not just a predictively supportive time, which I think was what people turn it into, but it's actually in the moments of strength, they're actually uh, a, a opportunity where there's a big fat tail and the market's more right distributed. Because the more put positioning you have in the market, meaning long puts by, um, by hedgers and short puts by dealers, the more you have of that, uh, essentially a hedge short put position in the market, um, the more you have a fat tail, because the quicker the market goes down, the more risk there is to those puts being in the money and it's convex, which is the position that dealers in the street are broadly in, in those environments. But yet the more higher probability of an up move, um, you know, and a right distributed move you have. Why? Because at the end of the day, that's the, the profit um, uh, of that position, right? Short put, short stock. The way to lock that in for a dealer is to buy back their stock, right? As time goes on and as volatility compresses and also to hedge and to sell stock into a stressful move to the downside. That market structure means in 95, 98% of scenarios, it's a very supportive, positive flow to markets. But in about two, three, one, depending on the scenario, right? It is a very fat tail, stressful, more stressful environment. Um, and so we need to always keep that in mind. And so the reaction function of markets is a function of how we're processing going through time, given this positioning, right? There are situations where, um, where the market breaks, right? As we saw, let's say in September and October, where it becomes clear if the market doesn't continue to push far enough because vols come up, right? That there's a tremendous amount more of buyback that needs to happen, right? But if the market does accelerate, then it can be very stressful. And that's not up or down, right? People are always like, oh, we're we going up or we're we going down. Tell me up or down, up or down, up or down. I'm like, you gotta understand how the reaction function works. And that doesn't mean there's not edge there, right? It's just not as simple as, oh, in this point of the counter, things go up. In this point of the counter, things go down. And I think people have a hard time processing that. Um, but what we do is have the cheat code. We understand what the reaction function is. So as we move through and as certain things happen, we know how to react. We know what that supply and demand is likely to be and what that does to change the probabilities of outcomes. 
So this is how you how the whole machine works. We could go through a lot more detail, but I think in a microcosm, that's how we need to look at things and how we need to think about things. Um, and, you know, again, a basic. Um, you know, uh, if I was just to summarize in basic, you know, you need to think about this broad short put in the market with short stock and how where it's located primarily, to what scale and size, and what that means for calendar outcomes based on the hedgers that have those positions. Huh? Beautiful, awesome, thank you. As somebody who deals, uh, you know, I, I would say primarily you're dealing in vol as well, right? And you're looking at vol going up or down as much or more so, would you say, as just indices and individual stocks rising and falling within your fund? And, and how are you approaching that? And I, I, I'm i curious how, you know, your everyday retail trader who's out there selling 30, 45 day minor condors or these spreads, they're short, essentially. Um, option spreads and things like that, how they can potentially use this as a way to hedge not only the big picture, right, their, their long portfolio, as you say, they're, they're long everything, but on those smaller scales. It's obviously not as simple as just going out and buying, you know, a long straddle on the S&P and, and hoping that it makes some sort of dramatic move one way or the other to hedge, because I think a lot of traders seen, especially recently, we, we correlate potentially volatility to some sort of downward move. But as you have spoken in the past, vol going down, market going up. And I think a lot of people have been hurt, especially I've seen, we've seen in our community, you know, a lot of traders selling these somewhat neutral positions but, and the market just won't stop going up and they're getting hurt that direction as well. So there's, we get that question a lot. Well, how can we potentially hedge against this? It's obviously not as simple as just buying VIX calls or, or buying puts because that's not, it's not quite that linear sometimes. So interested how you play off of that and how you look at that as you're moving through these cycles, as you call them, um, looking ahead maybe to the next expiration, to the quarterly six months, 12 months out in advance. Yeah, so the key, as kind of I, I alluded to a little bit before, is to understand what, what the distribution is about but the potential outcomes in your window, right? So if there is a window of time where there's very supportive flows in 95% of scenarios, but a fat left tail. Well, what's the right thing to do there? Let's just walk through that. Well, you want to go on that little tail. Maybe you go out and buy dimes and 15s and 20 cents or something to make sure that you have extra convexity in the very, very rare, unlikely scenario in those days, but you have a tail event because it would, it could be very, you know, a powerful tail move, but go sell vol in those windows, right? Because those are the windows where you're going to have, um, you know, the market supported and vol compressed based on the probability, you know, that would be in a supportive window. And then when you get to the windows where, you know, those supportive flows aren't there, um, but maybe the tail is a little less fat, right? In those scenarios, you probably want to go own some gamma, right? And, uh, and, and look for a potential weakness, um, but maybe be, you know, in that window, ironically, short some tail puts or things to kind of uh, to take a little profit against your short deltas or to kind of make your, your um, uh, you know, again, this is, I'm giving you examples and it'll depend on, on where, what your strategy is and what you're trying to, uh, you know, do. But, you, you know, your strategy, whatever it is that if you're doing it kind of and replicating again and again, has a certain exposure a certain thing you're you're saying i want to sell this because i think the probability of this coming down is higher than what the market actually says so and at the at, at the end of the day uh you know the question is is that true or not and based on these different windows sometimes the probability be higher and sometimes the probability be lower and sometimes it's not in most of the time it's not just about if it's higher or lower is is it is there a left left tail is there not and so you want to hedge the part that's dangerous or potentially kind of um, you know cheap um, while taking advantage of the parts that are expensive if you're selling and vice versa. So the point here is that, is that you really need to think about what does this mean about the window we're in and the distribution of outcomes during that window and then position to take advantage of uh, what, what that position looks like. Um, and, uh, and more times than not, and that'll mean levering up on your strategy or levering down during different windows and also adding some component or getting rid of maybe one side of the component or one, or the other side of the component um, based on that. Um, but again, the, the best advice I can give is to really think about how the probabilities change in different windows, not just two-dimensionally think, 
you know, vol is vol bid or it's going to go bid or bid or is vol going to go offered? Are we going up? Or are we going down? Like you really need to kind of try and think about what the probabilities are during the window that you're um, trying to invest in and uh, trying to position accordingly. And, and I think that's a good framework for anybody, regardless of your strategy, because that should help you you know, decide whether you should want to be more heavily into something or not um, in that period. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. That I do want to sort of circle back to that idea of, and I know you've mentioned this in the past, as you look forward, potentially multiple years, this idea of, you know, we could be entering a period where just this passive investing flow may underperform on adjusted returns with inflation and, and where the market could potentially go. And you have you have alluded in the past that a more active approach might be necessary if traders want to, you know, take that next step and outperform the market. Um, so it's great to hear you talk about that and sort of lay out the groundwork for what traders can potentially look at, where to educate themselves and place their bets, so to speak. So um, if you want to elaborate on that, I'll give you the floor yeah. on that. Um, yeah, I mean, that, the, this is a big, broad framework, but I'll try and summarize. And some I'll let you flex your macro email. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to. That, that could be a 30-minute discussion. So I'll try and give the, the shorter uh, version. But I think the big takeaway here is that uh, the Federal Reserve and monetary policy, um, which has really become dominant um, uh, since we came off of uh, the gold standard and, and it, uh, the federal, you know, the, the monetary policy central banks um, have realized kind of how much power they have in a fiat system. They have essentially, not surprisingly, become the primary driver of the economic cycle. And uh, that was why the Fed was originally created to smooth the business cycle. So that's their mandate. But the problem is they had two mandates, which is maximum employment and price stability. And at the end of the day, that doesn't, they're running the whole economy based on two simple numbers. And the whole economy is more complicated than that. And the most important part that's different is, is that, uh, you know, inequality. It's not just about jobs. It's about who has jobs, about who's making money. They're essentially maximizing GDP. And they have been for quite some time. But that means all the money is going to the top 0.1%, which is what's been happening for essentially 40 years. And compounded for 40 years, uh, that's created massive inequality. Gini coefficients here in the U.S. have uh, gone from 0.35 to about 0.46. Um, you know, we're now in line with third world countries. There is no middle class anymore. Um, and that's, I don't mean that sadly or that that's bad or right or anything. This isn't a political argument. It just is. And... Um, what that does over time is that creates, you know, if that happened for 40 years, which it has, that creates a generation or two, uh, I think millennials on down, who essentially were labor because they came out of college and tried to get jobs through those last 40 years um, and have fallen behind. You know, uh, millennials are at 40 percent the wealth creation and household formation um, that uh, or I think it's up to 45 to 50 percent now. But, you know, that's because of all this fiscal. But, uh, you know. They were at 40% of the wealth creation, household formation of baby boomers at this point in their generation. It's a big deficit, right, relative to generations past. And politically, they're now coming to political power. And uh, that's driven not just here in the U.S., but globally, particularly in the developed world, a dramatic amount of populism. This idea that, hey, it's, the system's broken. It's unfair. Um, we need to eat, too. Um, we, you know, and, and it's kind of this let them eat cake moment where the 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 people on the top are still trying to play the same shell game. And politically, the, the masses, left and right, to be clear, I mean, have gone left. You know, whether it's Donald Trump's, you know, uh, rusted out cities in middle America or it's, um, you know, uh, 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 AOC and uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, uh, obvious populist, you know, liberal economics. And uh, they're both the same. Uh, whether, you know, just a, a culture wars, uh, like thinly veiled under the surface. Um, but economically, they both are arguing for more money at the bottom. And, and it also, uh, the cousin of that is protectionism, right? Populism means we care about our people. Uh, money going to the top in capital is capitalism. And that spans uh, continents and countries and, and is profit maximizing. Um, Populism is not profit maximizing. We are we are optimizing to median outcomes instead of mean outcomes uh, as, a, as a culture. And, and it's not just here domestically, it's globally. When you start doing that, what happens? Well, you get into a global deglobalization. You, you get into protectionist 
um, uh, policies. We've seen that you know, now for almost eight years. Uh, we're starting to see a bifurcation between the primary beneficiary of all of this uh, monetary policy, which has been China and globalization, um, a bifurcation between China and, and the U.S., um, and that's leading to a ton of uh, global strife. It's not just war in Ukraine, Russia, and the Middle East. Uh, it's it's economic warfare, and it's um, it's it, it's trying to take money and bring it to people and take it away from corporations um, and and globalization. So that doesn't go away overnight, right? This is a rebalancing the pendulum, swinging from one side to another. And what it does is it takes Fed, the, the Federal Reserve and central banks and it puts them in a box because you start sending dollars to people on the bottom. What happens? They spend it. Send money to put the people on top, they invest it. So if you're sending all the money to the people on top, guess what? You get a bull market and growth and technology and globalization and China, you know, emerging markets. And guess what happens? Is it a surprise that China's in you know, stock markets in the gutter? Well, populism means you're taking money away from that and you're sending it back to the people of this country and trying to eliminate that competition and that efficiency. But that means what happens to goods? Goods get more expensive. People on the bottom make more money and they spend more money. Um, if that's what we want, we got an inflationary environment uh, for the meantime, because we're rebalancing from all this, uh, you know, this, these benefits we've got of from inequality over the other time. And that, that means markets don't do very well because in, during inflationary times, that means bond, mark, bond yields go up. And when bond yields go up, there's now an alternative to equities. So money flows out of the equity market into the bond market. And it's harder to borrow money. So liquidity comes out of the system, right? So there's less business activity as well. But to give you a parallel, it's 1968 to 1982. I've talked about this in other venues as well. That 14-year period, which is the last time we had inflation. I'm not just picking that out of the hat. That's literally the 14 years we last had an inflationary period. It's been that long. Markets, equity markets went nowhere. And in real terms, lost 70% of their market value over 14 years. How did that happen? And by the way, the economy grew above trend in real terms in real terms with inflation. So not just nominally did we have a lot of growth, we had above trend real economic growth over that 14 years, as opposed to the last 30 years, we've had below trend economic growth, but massive real you know, uh, yeah, equity performance. So this whole idea of fundamentals, which we talked about at the top of the show of like the market being somehow correlated with the economy is complete BS. It has nothing to do with it. I mean, they can, there's plenty of data sets that show this. You can argue that sometimes it's, it's inversely correlated, um, particularly over longer time frames, because when the economy is really hot, particularly through demand side economics, what happens? Well, the money is flowing to the, the bottom and that causes inflation, which drives money out of the equity market and into the bond market, um, not to mention just broadly out of investment altogether. So um, anyway, so uh, what happened just to put the more fundamental metrics on the market? The market had uh, really great profit margins going into 1968. Guess what? Those profit margins collapsed into 1982 because the cost of money, um, uh, you know, went up. Globalization went in reverse, right? All of the things and the benefits that created fat margins disappeared. What else happened? Well, uh, multiples went down. We went from mid twenties in the 1968 down to four and a half for a price to earnings ratio. People like four to half. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, how could the market get it so wrong? The market didn't get it wrong. You could get 20% years, 20% yields on the 10 year. Why would you yeah. go invest in the equity market? It wasn't wrong. It's just, it's all relative. Um, and so multiples dramatically declined margins collapsed. Um, and, and what does that do? Well, that, that means markets declined 70% in real terms over that, over that period. Um, so anyway, we, we'll get off the kind of the macro bus for a little bit, but the important takeaway to, to your traders and your investors are if we think this is more probable, okay, but we don't have to say this is 100% what's going to happen, but if we're, there's a higher probability now of, of interest rates not being zero or being very low anymore, um, you know, and, and we're more likely to have an inflationary, secularly inflationary period, what does that do? Well, that means the Federal Reserve's reaction function, its ability to come save us from all of these things and, and smooth the business cycle are, are diminished. That also means we have more geopolitical issues throughout the next 10, 15 years while this is going on. Um, and we know this in 68 to 82, what else happened? Well, we had an OPEC crisis, we had a, the Vietnam War, we had the increase of a Cold War with 
with Russia. Um, you know, I can go through all of the different, we have more labor rights, we had more internal strife, uh, right, and, and, and race uh, riots. And does any of this sound familiar? Does this sound like anything else that you're experiencing? I mean, by the way, everybody you talked to that grew up during that time thought the world was coming apart at the seams. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying this is the 60s redux, but you know, history rhymes um, uh, in some ways. You know, we didn't have zero interest rates. We, uh, you know, for leading up to that, we didn't have all the malinvestment that went into that. We didn't have the debts, you know, the national debt that we have now. There's all kinds of things that complicate this and make it actually more, uh, a little bit more dynamic and, and potentially uh, combustible. Um, but the big takeaway is that there are real risks. Uh, not just uh, it's not just your last forty years market. You know, we really are in this broad regime shift. That's a function of of generational. Um, you know, realities in the pendulum kind of rebalancing and swinging back. Um, and during those times, the big takeaway is you need to be active. What did you, what should you have done 68 to 82? Almost the exact opposite of what you were, would have done the last 30, 40 years. The last 34 years were based on cheap money and monetary policy was about growth over value. It was about emerging markets over, you know, um, other opportunities. It was, um, it was about, uh, you know, focusing on, uh, at all costs, uh, buying equity risk assets and buying the dip and aggressively playing momentum. Um, this market's different. This is, this market's about what are things with real fundamental value? Um, you know, uh, how are you, you know, how can you, uh, beat inflation, right? Because the, the problem 6082 was not that markets crash necessarily. We had several crisis along the way, but it was that over time, the, the cost of inflation ate away at, 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 at your money. So, um, you know, it's important to look at commodities as a look at the, the primary spend, spending of money in the 68 and 82, the economy was driven by spending, spending by government. Again, sound familiar? Probably want to go on the budget list of the U.S. government and go through and see where the where the money's being spent and how much, you know, expect that more money's coming that way. Go look at millennials. What do millennials need? They're at 40% of the wealth creation. They're the politically dominant uh, class and will be, you know, as, as the biggest kind of bubble demographic. Guess what? Uh, real estate, you know, uh, particularly starter homes. You're going to see policy to back that up. We've labeled a bunch of different things policy wise that are likely to happen in the next 10 years. And already, we've already seen two or three of them happen and the rest will likely happen over time as well. This is, uh, you know, it's all about incentives and the incentives are such that, um, you know, you want to invest in, in where the money is going to be spent in the maximization of median outcomes um, and going forward. To build off of that, you know, you're, you're referencing what a roughly 14 to 15 year period. And here we are coming off of one or two years and. Some people are potentially taking some victory laps already, right? Soft landing, Goldilocks in terms of, I know you are fond of debunking a little bit potentially. Um, and, and I I don't want to speak for you, but elaborate. I, you don't think we're out of the woods yet, obviously, as you're looking at all of that. Interested to hear maybe potentially shorter term as, as we enter a year that's, you know, potential have for strife from the geopolitical world. We're entering a, an election year how that will impact all of that monetary policy. I have a feeling you're going to disagree yeah. with. Yeah, so again, to refer back to what we started talking about, fundamentals, which is the macro piece I just talked about, does matter. Yep. It matters over periods like a decade. We're talking about a 14 year period. That That's the regime, that's the, the world you're in. If you got that right, by the way, the last 30, 40 years, that monetary policy was going to be dominant and you did, you, you're an incredibly wealthy person, right? But you would have gotten really hurt in 08, 09, right? Uh, when the market, crash 70%, you would have gotten really hurt in 2000, 2001 when the market, you know, tech dropped 90%, right? Um, so if you're looking on an annual basis, you know, you're going to look at those periods and say, oh my God, uh, this monetary policy thing, like it didn't matter. What matters is flows. Flows are what matter in the short term. Yeah. Uh, I want to be clear. If we're looking at a year or six months and we're, ask, we're asking, oh, well, are we out of the woods? How's the next year? You know, the macro piece matters. It doesn't not matter, but it's not very predictive for the next year's outcome. The longer you go, the more predictive it is. Guess what? We had a two year period. Market's gone more or less nowhere. And in real terms, it's lost 15% of its value. Does that sound familiar to something we just talked about, right? Over a longer period. But yeah, to your yeah. point, people are sitting there for the year being like, whoa, we, you know, market's up 30%. Like, oh, you guys are idiots. You missed the boat, blah, blah, blah. 
right? So point is understand the bigger picture, but now let's focus down to a year or shorter time frames, right? Let's understand how those flows might play out and how the path, a longer, bigger picture, right, may develop. And again, those are a function of shorter time frame flows and concert with these other bigger, longer term flows as well. Um, so election year, yes, critically important. And I would argue way more important than we've, and it's been in the last 40 years. Yeah. Because spending, as we just mentioned, from government is the primary driver. You know, if it was important before, you know, the last four years has been even more, right? What do we see as soon as Biden got into office? Nine trillion dollars of fiscal policy, right? If you thought, oh, it's an election year, we got to, you know, never mind kind of COVID, never mind any of the other stuff. Just the election cycle. People are like, oh, it's a coincidence. Just COVID happened. So fiscal spending, political cycle, bigger picture, fiscal spending is, is coming because populism, right? You get a spark in COVID and that really accelerates things and makes it historic, right? But the trend was there. And so 2020, getting in this kind of bounce and then this massive scream higher 2020, 2021 is not a, a huge shock if you're thinking bigger picture, right? And so it does matter. An election year matters. Now, I would argue whether it's Trump or Biden, it doesn't really matter. Um, we are going to get a massive amount of fiscal spending and continue to get it. It's uh, politically popular and populism is popular. So, you know, politicians will do more pop you know, populism. Uh, and, and, uh, and that means, uh, increased spending during these windows. Um, I think the way you look at that is it'll be easier to get unanimity in spending um, if we have a decline in markets and an economic slowdown. Um, and so, you know, you have to be mindful that if you get a decline in these, you know, in this early part of the year, which again, we've mentioned, we think is likely at some point, um, you're likely to get a pretty quick reaction from government and use it as a excuse to right, spend more money and uh, to get more supportive measures. But that's also going to be inflationary, right? Yeah. And it's going to continue down this path uh, and be supportive of long-term yields uh, and accelerate depending on what's happening. Otherwise, um, you know, this process. Um, so in the election year, yes, there's supportive flows and there's more spending, but that's also uh, likely to mean importantly, higher yields, um, after an initial pullback. And right now, everybody's kind of on the other side of the boat, right? Everybody's saying, oh, deflation's coming, recession, you know, we saw a pretty quick turnaround from 10 years at five plus to, to below four um, in just a matter of, uh, you know, a month and a half. Um, you know, I would remember what the broad trend is and understand that positioning is now a bit off sides to that. Um, and in election year, uh, I think you can lean on the fact that you're likely to get more spending and continue to force that higher. Um, so I think that's those are the important kind of pieces. Um, if you're going to get volatility and the recession, uh, it's also, uh, you know, the people in power are more inclined to want to get that out of the way so they can secure against volatility later in the year. Um, so I think that also makes the probabilities higher of um, a willingness to uh, get dry powder during this time of the year, um, which means yields are, uh, you know, which, you know, whether, whereas we had the QRA, which by the way, you know, that announcement's coming up on the 29th again here, where, where probably the last two months of the year, uh, Yellen really kind of backed off with the market down. Uh, you know, some of the issuance really went shorter duration and pulled from reverse repo. Uh, guess what? Now is our chance to really kind of get some of that issuance um, out of the way, accelerate a bit now that markets are higher. She doesn't want this market to run too much early in the year. She really wants it to run later in the year. Um, she's, by the way, this sounds, this sounds conspiratorial. She works for Biden. I mean, uh, you, if you think her incentives are, uh, you know, are somehow independent, you don't understand how that position works. Um, she is an employee of a political party. Um, and, uh, and so uh, she is likely to increase duration of issuance, which also makes sense given the, the, the draining of the reverse repo. Um, and uh, that's likely to be bad for liquidity, um, you know, in the market. Um, 
you know, so there are other things that, you know, you have to think about reaction functions and, and incentives uh, during this period. And there are very clear incentives more than other years, um, you know, in an election year. Um, and, and I think the biggest ones are, are really to uh, create a, a probability where, uh, you know, alongside with the other flows we're talking about, where things are uh, weighted a bit more weaker early in the year and then more bullish later in the year um, under the uh, under the understanding that, you know, the political party in power wants a really strong economy going into the election. All right, good job. We'll, we'll start to wrap this up. There's one thing I did want to ask about in conjunction sort of with those, those structural flows month over month. And you've talked about it and those that know you on, on the X are familiar with your chicken gif. So if you don't mind, Briefly expanding upon that 20 day moving average relative to one, one and a half, two standard deviation moves above is how you use that. If you use that, I've always wanted to hear a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, this is a basic, I mean, of all the things we do, this is one of the more kind of basic things that any, um, uh, you know, investor trader can use and add to their process, right? Um, Bollinger bands in all different forms are measures of, are statistical measures. Right, and you can do exponential or you know simple moving averages and the Bollinger bands around that. But what that essentially does is it gives you a really clear uh, volatility adjust kind of momentum, um, and it can really allow you to understand how far things are deviating uh, from from the norms, and also understand relative to this framework then what's happening. You know, there are different regimes you can build. Um, you know on this kind of Bollinger Band framework. If you continue to have certain support over, uh, you know, over certain periods and certain strength, um, you know, it'll, it'll allow you to create a, a healthier way to manage dips and, and buys, you know, the dips and sales uh, across a period as opposed to just looking at nominal price. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that's very useful um, for judging um, momentum broadly and strength. Uh, I want to be clear again. I don't have the whole picture. People are like, why are you using so simple something as simple as Bollinger bands in this? I don't have the full picture. What I have is a certain uh, amount of, of the supply and demand, and there's about call it fifty percent that I can't measure. So I have an edge. I, I, I have a, a sense of okay, this is a, a likely to be a more uh, bullish time because of uh, support. The likely the market's likely to be more supported. But that doesn't mean I, I know the market's going up ten percent or. Uh, going up 1% or even just sitting there. I know these flows are there. And the question is what's happening to the other ones. And so you can deduct a lot about the other things you don't know, given what you do know, if you look at strength and price, right? So understanding price as a function of what you do know actually in terms of fundamental flows, like actual flows that are coming in the market is incredibly helpful to, uh, for you to understand what's happening with the other ones you don't know. Um, and, uh, and so we really use it in that way. We really try and, um, you know, read price, uh, from, from, uh, kind of a broad Bollinger band structure. You can do it in a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, but we've, uh, set up, you know, uh, mechanisms to broadly understand how that those flows in that structure are reacting and what that likely means for the other flows that we don't know. Um, and, and that's very helpful. Uh, you know, why the 20 day, 20 days, essentially a month. You could go 20 or 21. Uh, the reason we do 20, again, uh, this is minor details. It doesn't make a big difference is because the four week option cycle, we believe the monthly cycles are one of the most driving uh, important factors. Um, when we go to a five week cycle, we'll actually, uh, you know, broadly adjust that. Um, but most cycles are four weeks. So 20 days tends to work best for those, those cycles. But again, you could do 21 day and work just as well. Um, but uh, again, monthly cycles are important. And, and so being, you know, watching over that cycle period broadly is very important to understanding momentum during that window. Yeah. Would you say there's some sort of magnet effect, if you will, if you're looking 20 days out on that moving average, if I'm looking potentially from one optics to the next and we start to get stretched almost at that it wants to come back there by the time it hits the next OPEX state, is that simplifying it too much? Yeah, I mean, at some point this becomes, actual... there's multiple effects here. Uh, uh, one, it's something yeah. that a lot of uh, algos and, and entities that are watching are looking at as a, as a sign of strength. Um, and, uh, you know, and strong, healthy markets have, have momentum. That is a, a fair value way to get back in, right, to a strong market. And that's a very healthy sign if things bounce in those general areas. So, um, uh, you know, 
healthy markets um, broadly don't, you know, and again, it depends on what, I don't want to overgeneralize, right? But healthy markets don't broadly break one standard deviation down in a market um, on a regular, on a, on a strong kind of repeating basis. Um, you know, when you start doing that, that's a really a sign of, okay, look, things, uh, momentum is weak. There's other things going on, particularly if, you know, there's supportive flows and something like that happens, right? That's a big kind of, okay, you know, something else is going on here price-wise. The other flows are really overwhelming these other flows that should be strong. And that's something to be mindful of. So again, you're using it as a tool and you're using it as a tool to broadly, um, to understand, to take what you do know and uh, help analyze better and break down uh, what you don't know. And that can lead to a significant amount of edge. Uh, price is very helpful. Um, again, uh, for the longest time, people have uh, used price and technical analysis to broadly um, predict things they don't understand, like the flows that we understand and fully know, right? So people are have been pointing out seasonality, for example, forever, right? Or other things along those lines. Um, not understanding what's happening under the hood, but just watching price and saying, there's something happening here. And I've never said that that's not useful, right? That is useful. You'd rather understand what's happening so you don't get caught in some, making some assumptions about things that you don't understand. But in the context where we don't know something and we do know certain things, it can be very helpful, again, to look at price and broadly try and understand some of what's happening outside of what we understand. I asked our community if they had any questions for you specifically. Um, so you kind of run through these pretty quickly. Um, You've, you've elaborated on a lot today, which we appreciate and a lot to digest. But um, this is a great one because you speak a lot about things like dealer positioning flows, fixed um, fixed strike vol, things like that. Straightforward question. Where can retail investors find data on things like that? Is that something that's proprietary to you? Is there somewhere, some website they can go to they'd want to know? So uh, fixed strike vol is um, a good baseline for people to do. I think Anybody can do this, uh, by the way. I think, um, you know, measuring fixed strike vol can be pretty straightforward. You're going to put a little bit of time in. Um, if you're trading, if you're taking time to listen to me here, you're spending an hour here, you know, again, spend a few hours, spend a day, go go look at the option chains, feed that data in somewhere and, and take a look at end of day where the applied volatility, which you can get from a lot of different sources is. And where is that, right, at 30 days or whatever interval you want? relative to where that implied vol that strike was yesterday or at, on any given time. And that's going to tell you what, what's happening to fixed strike vol. Now, there's not a, a simple indicator out there. There's not a, you know, uh, there may be some services out there that I'm not familiar with that provide it. But at the end of the day, it, it's super easy to do on your own. And I, I think it'd be almost silly to go pay somebody or do something something that you can very easily do at home and, and track. And, and that will really, the importance of that is that will tell you what's happening to implied volatility in reality. Not just what the VIX is telling you, which is not at all, uh, you know, it really doesn't give you a sense of what's happening to implied vol uh, in reality. It's a, just a measure of where the, the current vol you've moved to is in the market and, and really has much more to do with the skew in the market and the move that's that's transpired. So that would be the fixed strike answer I'd give you. Um, other, you know, if you're looking for uh, other data, like uh, what's the positioning? Tell me, you know, there's, uh, you know, I think I have propagated at least 20 different uh, websites now that give some open interest from uh, and positioning yeah. um, in the market. Um, the reality is that's all a very basic uh, look at uh, something that is much more complicated than that. Uh, I can't tell you how to, to you know, what we do in, exactly in order to understand what the positioning actually looks like. Um, but you can, um, again, you can use some of those to get some idea and you can also, um, you know, go go under go track actual uh, trading and positioning over different periods and, and, and kind of model things um, in terms of price as well. Fantastic! All right, Jim, we are pretty much at our time. I think we'll let you sail us off into the distance. This window that you have mentioned is potentially closing here towards the end of the month. You said to keep an eye out for the next one, potentially around Valentine's Day through Feb Opex. Something you're still keeping an eye on? You know, we've been pretty vocal for three uh, three months almost about kind of, look, this market's very strong during this window due to flows starting from November 1st through middle of January, call it January 17th or so. Um, now comes the period to be more cautious and watchful. Um, we 
we're pretty clear that you know we would likely see you know new highs a double top or uh, minor new highs uh, you know uh, you know get get some kind of roll, push up and then roll over during this period. Um, we'll see. It does, I mean, that's the, the probabilities and the flows uh, say are more likely. Now that doesn't go in a straight line, right? I mean, we were fortunate enough to call kind of the almost the day the, the move down in September, uh, almost the day the the rally back you know, rally back in the markets. Yeah, we're not going to do that 100% of the time, um, uh, you know, uh, but, but but the reality is the probabilities here are well suited for um, less positive supportive flows, which um, likely to mean that, that, you know, going forward, that this is not as good a time to be long. We got a 20% to 25% rally off that November 1st law. Um, it has only been two and a half months. Um, you know, if you're chasing this up here now without those fundamental seasonal flows that we talk about, you know, uh, could work, but uh, would not, would not be the time in our, in our book to, to be chasing that. Um, we do think you'll get an opportunity to buy back in um, and on a risk adjusted basis, um, this is not the time to be bullish. Now, does that mean you go short it? Uh, probably not, right? Uh, time to be watchful and ready for the signs, right? That this could very well, um, you know, break. Now, vol is well supplied. We've been saying that you got to keep an eye on vol. Fixed strike vol is, is today crushed. Um, it had a decent amount of support for a couple of days, but really didn't last long. And, uh, you know, the market is stable. Vol is now relatively pinned at relatively low vols. And there's a decent chance that this will, at this point, you know, we need another, we have the 29th coming up for the QR announcement. We have a little bit of a window where this can still wobble and, and take it out. But by, you know, the end of the month, if the market is up, by the way, going into the end of the month, I would, I would bail on this, uh, you know, immediately after the, um, the January 31st um, Fed announcement comes out. If, if it's not, uh, you know, negative and the market kind of hangs in, um, you know, February 2nd or so, right, which is the, the, the date we've kind of uh, put on that, you'll know. And at that point, um, you know, you're looking for an opportunity to get back in. And uh, if, again, vol hasn't become unpinned, if the market hasn't uh, broken and shown in terms of price, the, the weakness, um, and that you're looking to get back in for a couple of weeks. Again, you're kind of dancing by the door. You're not going all in long kind of, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing more supportive flows come back during that period. And, and it's, a, it's a healthy time to be kind of playing from that side. That February kind of window of weakness, which starts on Valentine's Day, um, is really, and we've said this before, the more probable time to get that weakness. Um, and it could start in this window and carry over and get worse in that period. Or you could see some type of blow off top. Um, you know, maybe we get to 49, 50, 5,000, right? 5,000 is a nice big number that people get, could really start calling, you know, when everybody starts calling for 5,200, I think is, it will be an interesting moment to, to kind of turn the other way. And again, if that lines up with that window, then we would be very, um, you know, looking for that weakness and vol to pick up to really potentially short the, this thing. So we'll see. We're watching carefully before we were pretty clear for three months that, you know, risk on push, you know, push things. Um, and now is not the time to do that. Um, uh, especially in this kind of week and a half window here, again, you can play it for a couple of weeks in that Feb second to 14th window. Um, if this thing doesn't, um, kind of, if all doesn't pick up and if this thing doesn't decline. So hopefully that gives a pretty clear roadmap to people, not just long, short though. Again, remember it, you have to think about the, the fat tail with the right distributed when you're looking at these windows that are bullish and play accordingly. Those are fantastic takeaways. I think for traders, as we leave this conversation, right? Potential does not mean guarantee be water, find these windows, take your chances if it's there, but you have to be willing to flow with the market, right? So it's, it's, if it was only that easy, right, John, if we could just point out a day and push the chips all in one way or the other, the, right? The key for anybody playing in the op in options land is to bend the probabilities in your favor. And that does not mean, uh, you know, uh, going long the market, short the market predictively. It is, it is really trying to use the option chain to take advantage when things are less probable in parts of it and more probable. And I think if you approach things that way um, and you're very, uh, you're putting structures together that are 
lower risk and higher probability of capturing the probabilities um, that are in your favor, you will do very, very well over the long run. What better way to end the day, Jim? Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you coming and taking the time speaking to me, Option Alpha community everywhere, traders. Um, as always, learned a lot. Hopefully we can catch up again sometime in the future. Um, for those of you who are following Jem, jump on the X at Jam Croissant. Anywhere else you would like traders to come find you? or Yeah, Jam underscore Croissant on X is uh, where you can follow us. And then uh, if, uh, if you have potential interest in investment, anybody on here, please go to our website uh, at kaivolatility.com. Uh, you can schedule a call with me uh, through our system, um, you know, uh, uh, for potential investment. Other than that, uh, Again, uh, we have a Kai Volatility uh, backslash news where you can subscribe to a lot of our media and, and the things we put out. Um, and I encourage people to do that as well. But Fantastic. great being here. Thanks for having me, Steve, and, and look forward to keeping in touch. Mm -hmm.